I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. So normally I am an optimist, but this might be the most pessimistic podcast we've ever done. Jay, do you think? Like I kept trying for optimism there. And That's no way because every time you're like, we have to end on a positive vibe, positive outcome. I, I got it as optimistic like, no. as I could by the end. So, so, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, look, a lot of people, myself included, are worried about what's happening with the whole tensions between China and Taiwan, a worldwide situation that affects everyone on the planet. What's going on? The tensions are rising. U.S. and all its allies are there. China is sending missiles, exercises all over the place. Lots of tensions are happening. So we brought back on one of our favorite guests, General Robert Spaulding. He's the author of War Without Rules, China's Playbook for Global Domination. I highly recommend people read it. It's very So who is General Spaulding? Well, he was the White House top advisor for many years on China and our relations with China. Now he wrote this book, uh, War Without Rules, China's Playbook for Global Domination. Um, he's already been on the podcast to talk about the book, but I've been so nervous about this situation. I wanted to see what he thought. What's going to happen? With Taiwan, will China invade Taiwan? How will the U.S. respond? What will happen around the world? What's going to happen to all our pharmaceuticals that's made in China, which is about 99% of our medicine is made in China, plus, you know, of course, a lot of our tech, our food, and, and on and on. General Spaulding was great enough to come back on and really answer all of our questions. So here's General Spaulding, author of War Without Rules, China's Playbook for Global Domination. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. General, there's a lot of stuff going on that we're scared about, to be honest. And it starts off with, I guess, Nancy Pelosi's visits to Taiwan and China being upset about this and Biden saying he had nothing to do with it. It's all very confusing and missiles are being fired over Japan's economic zone and everybody's posturing. But what's the reality right now? Well, the reality is I love these titles in U.S. media where it says Pelosi goes to Taiwan, China outraged. The fact part of that is Pelosi goes to Taiwan. The China outraged is manufactured narrative. It is propaganda. 
but it is completely picked up by our own media as fact. China outraged. Most people in China could care less what Nancy Pelosi is doing. They're worried about their own problems. You know, there's 1.4 billion Chinese people. And for the most part, they could care less what the Communist Party thinks. But what our media portrays is what the Communist Party wants them to portray, which is China is outraged. Now, to the extent that Chinese people know about Pelosi going to Taiwan, it's because the Chinese Communist Party told them Pelosi was going to Taiwan and they use it to manufacture rage. And they do that to create support for their own regime. But, but, but let me ask you, like, aren't we more worried about the Chinese government being outraged than the people? Like, the Chinese government's the one that's sending missiles around. But they're not outraged. This is part of their narrative. So mm. when we think about, you know, what's China going to do with regard to Taiwan? They've already decided what they're going to do. And she talks about it all the time. We're going to take Taiwan. What they will do when they decide to do that, and when the timing is right, they will use something like, Pelosi went to Taiwan, so we had to take it. That's what they will use. So everything with regard to after Pelosi goes to Taiwan is entirely manufactured by the Chinese Communist Party, consumed by our media, and then disseminated to the world. And What's unfortunate, I think, is that in Washington, D.C., within the Beltway, the China experts aren't savvy enough to distinguish between what's really going on in China with the Chinese Communist Party and propaganda. In fact, they're all about the propaganda. And if you looked at all the um, talking heads within Washington, D.C., they're like, how could Pelosi do this? How could Biden lose control of the China relationship? And it's all completely ridiculous. Again, the narrative is manufactured by the Chinese Communist Party for their own purposes. Then we feed into it and attack ourselves. This is the beauty mm. of unrestricted warfare. It has become part of our lexicon. It has become part of our way of thinking, entirely manufactured by the Chinese Communist Party for their own interests. Well, and this goes to your broader point from your book that everything China does is essentially part of their war, whether it's military or through communications or through economics or through trade negotiations. It's all part of their larger picture of war. And we don't really, when I say we, I'm talking about the U.S. government, but the U.S. in general doesn't really think that way. Not everything we do is thought in the context of war. But in the context of war, when the Chinese government is outraged and they and they send missiles over Japan and you're saying they're going to use Pelosi as potentially an excuse what will happen? Like, what do you think is going to happen? Oh, they're going to invade Taiwan. There's no doubt they're going to invade Taiwan. The question that remains is, what's our part to play? If we play a part, everything that we have within the Indo-Pacific will be taken out within minutes, within minutes. Well, what does that mean? They have so many missiles, so many rockets on their side of the strip. They've been building this for decades. They have so much war material on their side. So you forget about Ukraine, you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That is kids play. Ukraine was a little fireworks show. We're talking about Lord of the Rings on steroids that China has in terms of weapons to go against not just Taiwan, but all the allies in the region that might think that they would wish to interfere. And that includes not just fixed assets like bases, like Guam. It also corresponds to ships, whether it be aircraft carriers or frigates or destroyers, doesn't matter. They have far more weapons than they have targets. Now, why would she be that interested militarily in Taiwan? Like, why does he care that much? Is it just to kind of bolster his own reputation at home? Or is there an economic reason he would go for it? Uh, go back to Chinese Communist Party narrative. You know, Taiwan has to come back into the fold. It is one of the things that will indicate that China has arisen. China has returned to their place in the world. They have basically extinguished all the grievances. Now they are dominant and they cannot claim that until Taiwan is brought back into the fold. Now, the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party is we can do this. Only we as a party can do this for China. And therefore, we have to be in control. 
And then eventually we will bring back Taiwan, but it will be in addition to all the other things that we've lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. We've created this massive war machine. We we are the industrial base of the world. And we basically settled all of these territorial disputes. Now, Xinjiang, which is basically Chinese for East Turkestan, which was taken nine days after the Chinese Communist Party took over the mainland, was never a part of China. But they claim all these territorial grievances to include the Nine Dash Line in the South China Sea. So all of those will be rectified when China fully um, arises from its uh, century of humiliation. So this is part of the narrative. They built it as part of their legitimacy. Now, why? So the, that's not the question. Though. The question that you want to know is why will she do this and potentially upset the apple cart with regard to their economy? That's a question you want to know. And the answer is because it is a totalitarian regime. Why did Hitler open up two fronts? Why did the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor? Why did Putin invade Ukraine? They can't help themselves. It's this sense of entitlement and hubris that forces them to act. And so, you know, people were asking me before Putin invaded Ukraine, is he going to invade Ukraine? And I said, yes. And the question is why? And well, because he's Putin. Why is she going to invade Taiwan? Because he's she. If he was a democratic elected leader of the United States, he wouldn't do it. But he's a leader of a totalitarian system. Who's going to stop him? Who's going to tell him, don't do this? You know, he's going to do what he wants to do. That's what happens. And therein, I believe, hopefully, I pray, lies our salvation, that we begin to see, okay, I understand now what this regime is. I think I understood Russia before, but China, oh, I didn't know that China was, you know, this rogue state that was, you know, led by a totalitarian leader. Hopefully when they invade Taiwan, we'll figure that out. Now, I mean, this leads to so many different questions, but I mean, the most basic is, do you think we will respond in any way militarily if, China, I mean, we're kind of implying that we would stop China from invading Taiwan. Like we're doing military exercises there, all of our allies are as well which kind of implies, hey, Taiwan, don't worry, we're here. But clearly, if we do anything, to your point, we're going to lose immediately and World War III could potentially start. Well, so people ask me, have asked me, we want to stop an invasion of Taiwan. How do we do that? Very easy, simple. Give the Taiwanese nuclear weapons. Just give them to them and just let them then defend themselves by threatening the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party with nuclear weapons. So how do we stop a war between China and Taiwan? We give the Taiwanese nuclear weapons. Now, are we going to do that? No, we don't do that. In fact, they had their own nuclear program and we suppressed it. We said, don't do that. And by the way, that's the same thing that happened in Ukraine. We told them to get rid of their nuclear weapons. And guess what? They didn't have anything to, to deter a Russian attack. So now everybody's going to say, well, we can't give the Taiwanese nuclear weapons. Okay, well, then the Chinese aren't going to be deterred from attacking. What we could do is what we did with Europe and, and the Soviet Union. We said, look, if you move every one of our nuclear weapons, we're going to use them. The reason we did that, there's a, there's a nice a little uh, monograph written by a gentleman named Lieutenant General Glenn Kent. At the time he did the study, mathematician, uh, he was a one star in the military. He was tasked with figuring out 1964 how much would it cost to protect America from a Soviet ICBM attack? So he calculated it would cost $28 billion in 1964 to protect 70% of the society. So we could protect 70% of America. To protect 90% would cost six times that, okay? But here's the kicker. For every dollar the Soviets spent on ICBMs, it would take us six dollars to defend against mm -hmm. that. And so what they calculated was we could not defend the country against an offensive threat uh, using nuclear weapons. And therefore, we adopted this approach called mutually assured destruction. We told the Soviets, if you invade Western Europe, we will unleash everything that we have against you. And that kept the peace. Now, we've completely forgotten deterrence theory and how we use nuclear weapons to prevent the Third World War from ever happening with the Soviet Union. But we don't think like that anymore. There's actually people in the Pentagon today that think that we can fight China 
and potentially win and not have a war with China eventually become nuclear. Our salvation in terms of fighting China is convincing them that if we fight, it will go to nuclear war, which means it will threaten the leadership and survival of the Chinese Communist Party. That's the only way. And we're not un we're unwilling to do that. So therefore, what I think in terms of your answer is, if we do get involved in Taiwan, it will be to either resupply or evacuate the island. Very much so. You have, you have to begin to think this was happening very early on in the Cold War with the Berlin airlift, right? We supply, resupplied uh, Western Berlin because the Soviets cut it off. Now, why did we not invade Germany, take back East Germany, take back East Berlin? Because the Soviets had nuclear weapons. So we said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to go to war. We're going to wait and we're going to um, we're going to let this long term competition play out. And so I think if we are if we do get involved in the China Taiwan thing, it'll be with regard to resupply, with regard to evacuation um, and that then hopefully we will be engaged in a Cold War at that time. The Chinese are already in a Cold War. We're not. Mm. The other issue that you have to consider, though, is China brought in all the bankers in April around the world, brought them to China and said, OK, these are the sanctions that are going against the, the Russians because they invaded Ukraine. How do we get out from under them? Right. So they're preparing the battlefield for any financial sanctions that, that they might uh, have to ensure that they're not affected by them. So our sanctions will not be effective over China. Why? Because they have currency exchange with the Saudis to buy oil. They can use renminbi instead of dollars. But the other thing that you have to consider is that if we decide we're going to sanction China for invading Taiwan, we're going to punish them. We're going to use the might of our Treasury Department, of the Fed. We're going to make sure that nobody does any financial transactions with China. OK, what's going to happen? They're going to turn around and say, guess what? You are not getting a single shipment of antibiotics anymore. And guess where our antibiotics come from? They come from China. Microelectronics. I mean, everything that we need almost has some either the product itself or the, the materials for the product is manufactured in China. A lot of chemicals, for example. Well, and, and we're going to get more to this in a second. I know Robin has some, some questions about this, but, you know, they make our antibiotics. They make a lot of our computers, like our, our, our phones, they make our clothes, they package our food. And for some reason, we've never diversified away from this. And to your point, the last time you were on the podcast, it would take years to basically change this supply chain away from China. Like it's, it's going to literally take years. And so is it all just false posturing when we say, hey, we're going to help Taiwan? Like we literally can't, like they could do more damage to us. Now, the one thing we can do to them is we can cancel our debt to them. Like we owe them $2 trillion. We could say, hey, we're not going to pay you back, but they probably don't care. The government probably doesn't care about that. So what is going on? It feels like we're just kind of fighting in the dark, making stuff up as we go. And they've got a real strategy. Well, I mean, I think it's not um, that book that I just mentioned that talked about Lieutenant General Quinn Kent. It was something he wrote after he retired. He wanted to talk about, you know, what he had learned and what he had worked on in his time in the Department of Defense. And if you read that and you begin to consider um, guys that and gals that were working on these problems, how do you prevent nuclear war from happening? What do you need to do? All of that expertise and knowledge about how that we got through the Cold War is gone. They had programs in universities that were teaching deterrence theory. They were teaching about you know, national security in a Cold War context. Now, that grew up at about the same time that we went from these very crude nuclear weapons to, you know, fusion weapons. Today, all that expertise is gone. And so when you go to the Pentagon, you say, hey, I want to talk about deterrence theory. They're like, go sit in a corner, you nerd. We want to talk about war fighting like in Iraq and Afghanistan. Deterrence theory, what a joke. But it's the most important thing that we could be thinking about right now because it is a thing that got us through the Cold War without having a war. It's, a, it's called a Cold War because it didn't become a hot war and kill hundreds of millions of people. But the, 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 the thinking that went into that strategically 
is gone. It's it's absent. And even in the in, in people like President Biden, he was never an expert on deterrence theory. So he might have grown up and lived through that era. But if you think about people like me, you did not come of age and gain rank in the military by thinking about nuclear deterrence, by thinking about how to prevent war. You came of age and got promoted by going to war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Non-nuclear powers that we could steamroll like nobody's business. So there's no academic programs anymore. The think tanks don't really um, support this. There's a few people, again, I'll call them nerds. They're like, go stand in the corner and think about nukes. Nobody wants to hear it. But that is the type of way that we need to think with regard to China, because otherwise, I could see us stumbling into a war by thinking, oh, we can just have, we can keep this war conventional and it'll never go nuclear. You can't, once the genie, the war genie is out of the bottle, trying to determine which way this goes, forget about it. You have no, you have no control over it. NAS passions are inflamed and as people die, the tendency to escalate goes up. And so there's all this discussion about, you know, how do we, how do we prevent this from escalating nuclear war? It's all pie in the sky. You know, once that war starts, making sure that you don't have a nuclear war is your biggest problem and probably one that's not possible. So we need to be thinking now, how do we prevent a war? And the people that actually study that intently are all, all gone. Given that, my guess is China is going to back channel and say, look, if you touch us in Taiwan, we're going to drop nukes on you because they know that the U.S. is not prepared to hear that. And the U.S. doesn't want, obviously, Biden doesn't want to risk, a, nobody wants to risk a nuclear war, but they're going to be, they're going to act more out of fear than aggression. And my guess is we'll back off in somehow in a way we did with Ukraine and say, okay, we're going to start with sanctions. We don't really have diplomatic relations with Taiwan anyway. Uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. They're going to sort of back off what they've been saying. Do you think that's what will happen or what, what, what do you think? What's your gut tell you will happen? Because I don't think we'll get into a nuclear war over this, even though we're kind of posturing for it. No, I, I think what will happen is that will begin in earnest for the West because it's already happened in China uh, and, and in Russia. That will begin in earnest for the West, the second Cold War. And we will begin to decouple economically, politically, academically, financially from um, China and its satellites, which include the Belt and Road Initiative countries and Russia and North Korea and Iran and, and other authoritarian regimes. And then we're going to start to have to rebuild the mechanisms that got us through the first Cold War. But we're but now we're doing so at a disadvantage, you know, where during the first Cold War, we own the industrial base. Now China owns it. So we can't produce uh, all the goods where before America could produce all the goods. So, you know, it is not a definite thing that democracies survive the second Cold War because what you're seeing around the world is this increasing affinity for the system that China has created. It's a political economic system that says, don't challenge the government, don't get involved in politics, let the party take care of that and we'll give you a job. We'll make sure that you have employment. But the challenge of that model is, and this is the part that the Chinese have hit so well, is it relies on the talent, technology, and capital of the West. So 75% of the country is state-owned enterprise led the, of the economy and technology, talent, capital from the West comes in and deals with the fact that those companies are less efficient in terms of productivity. Nobody knows that in terms of all of these Belt and Road Initiative countries, or if they do, they're more interested in what China will give them in terms of like loans for the port of Hambantota in Sri Lanka. So this is what's happening is you have this, the world saying democracy is dead. That model doesn't work. You know, you got infighting in America, you got infighting in the UK, in Europe. It doesn't actually produce outcomes for the citizens, China's model does. And so what happens over time, they own the supply chain, they own the narrative. Then you have to start to worry about, will our system, because we're not gonna fight, we've made that determination, it's a, it's a bad idea, nuclear weapons and all, but we don't have the industrial base or the kind of 
credibility now internationally to say democracy is a better system. China, we say democracy is a better system. And China says, yeah, but you have riots in the streets because you're, you're racist. Mm. You have homeless people. You don't take care of your people. By the way, we have all kinds of jobs. Why? Because we own all the manufacturing. So we make sure our people have jobs. So you guys are better. It's a joke. So we've lost that, um, that ability to say America is a better system. China now has it. And now we get into this Cold War where we start to rally the democracies. And democracy is like, who do you, who are you to talk to us, to lead us? I mean, you don't really, you're not doing it from a position of strength like you were doing the, during the first Cold War. And so what happens? Well, the Chinese start to pick us off state by state. You know, slowly they start to convince, you know, the, the, the political system that, hey, let's go over on the Chinese side. You know, the Americans are running out of ideas and money and everything else, but the Chinese are giving it away. OK, so if we just leave this system and go to that system, they'll take care of us. And so what I'm telling you is that we it, winning a Cold War on the second time around is not necessarily a given. And so you have to ask yourself, what happens then? Our system comes under attack from within. We begin to attack our system. In fact, that process has already started. You know what I love about fantasy sports? is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like, I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual 
class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. What about the rumors and maybe more than rumors that the Chinese economy is starting to fall apart? They're having a situation similar to our 2008 financial crisis and maybe not the wherewithal to fix things. So is that happening? Like well, there are con maybe the one reason why she might act in Taiwan is to distract the Chinese population and the world from what's really happening in their economy. Well, I mean, we've known about their debt problems and their real estate problems and what happens. Western capital continues to flow in. The problem is the Chinese, and if you read Unrestricted war Warfare, you know, don't read that, read War Without Rules is an easier read. They recognize that they were um, vulnerable to the global financial system. And they talk about George Soros and they talk about the Asian financial crisis. And they recognize that the, the, that the Asian countries were decimated by the Asian financial crisis. And so they said, we need to prepare for that. So what did they do? They created a closed financial system. They have a non-convertible currency and strict capital control. So now when Citibank, for example, who's got, I don't know how much money invested on loans in China for real estate or any of the other big banks, they try to like bring that back. Like, hey, I want to, I want to pull my capital out. Things aren't looking so good there. How do they do that? Well, they have to actually you know, exchange and, and, and pull that capital out. But they've got non-convertible currency and strict capital controls. So now when you had during the Asian financial crisis, as soon as you get a hint of trouble, currency flows out, that's not happening in China. And so I don't believe that you're going to have a financial collapse in China because the Chinese Communist Party totally controls the financial system and it is decoupled, their financial system is decoupled from the global financial system. So you're not going to have a run on Chinese banks in terms of capital flowing out. And, and they have Hong Kong. So Hong Kong continues to draw in capital. That capital then makes its way into China, exchange um, you know, currency for yuan. Then it's stuck and they own it. So, I mean, they should have never been allowed to join the global financial system ever by creating that kind of financial system, but they were really smart. And we, uh, we bait, now they're part of the IMF currency basket. They're part of the world bank money flows in and doesn't flow out. And so when we step back and say, Oh, their system's going to fall apart. No, it's not. They've designed a system that can't fall apart. You know why? Because when you come knocking for your, for your deposits, they're like, sorry, not going to happen. Wouldn't that make them less capable of growing their economy though? Because if money, money's not going to flow in. Like the, the thing about America is everybody lends us money because it's a great innovative system, but nobody's going to lend China money and an economy is grows on its ability to, to take on some leverage, some debt. So wouldn't that ultimately limit China? <laughs> yes. Um, if they hadn't built the Belt and Road Initiative, 
the, the Belt and Road Initiative is their lifeline. And so the currency swaps, uh, even the digital currency, so the digital Silk Road, the, the maritime and the landward version of the Silk Road, all of that combines into a closed ecosystem. So they don't need dollars. And in fact, they're negotiating currency swap, uh, buying petrol from uh, oil from Saudi with, uh, and now, of course, they've got the Russians who are selling them all the oil they want. What do they need that they can't buy with renminbi? And since they can print renminbi, and since you can take renminbi and buy all the goods in the world because they're all produced in China, what do they need that they don't currently have? So yes, will it slow down their economy because Western capital won't be going in, allowing them to have dollars to buy other stuff? Yes, but they built a system to make up for that. So they own the industrial base. They Now they just um, proved that they could build seven nanometer uh, chips. I don't think there's anything else that they need. And that and therein lies why, you know, Xi, I think, is going to feel comfortable about taking Taiwan. He doesn't need anything else from the West. He has all the technology. He has all the uh, factories. He has everything that he needs. He has the ability to get resources because he negotiated this Belt and Road Agreement, which allows him to get all the raw materials he needs, all the energy he needs, and he owns a supply chain. So, I mean, I guess yeah, I have to turn it back on you. Like, what do they need that they don't actually have right now and that, that they can't procure with the Belt and Road Initiative? It's a good question because, and then, you know, Robin, if you want to jump in here, like, why are they buying so much land and mining rights and so on in the U.S. right now? They are coming in through Canada, you know, Canadian companies going into Nevada, which is one of the largest you know, lithium mines, I think that they have found uh, in the world. Uh, but now they're coming in that way and mining it and shipping it over to mainland China. I mean, why are we letting them do that? Well, so remember what happened to the Russians? They, they couldn't spend their dollars, right? We said, no, you, your dollars are frozen. You can't spend dollars. You, know, you can't pay off your debt. You, can't, you cannot. So that's one thing that, that the United States has control over the use of dollars. Um, if we have a crisis. Well, so they're just taking dollars as fast as they can and converting them to hard assets, real estate, you know, um, any kind of mine or any kind of natural resource. They are just buying it up by the bucket loads because, you know, then they own it. Right. But I mean, why are we allowing, I mean, that should be something that our government shouldn't allow them to have, our resources. I mean, and it's the purest li lithium too. We, it doesn't need a lot of refinement. I mean, it's pretty pure. So why are we letting them come in? They're coming in through Canadian companies. If you, you know, with the, I, I wanted to invest in some pure play lithium American companies. I couldn't find any. All of them led to China. And it's like now they're buying the farmland. They want the water rights in Nevada. I mean, which is crazy to me. But I was like, why is our government allowing them to do this? Like, if I know it, I'm just a housewife. I'm like, I know that they're coming in through Canada and, and Canada is just, you know, a shell company for them to, to come in so that they don't go on Joe. They're not going to allow them to do it. But, you know, a Canadian company with a normal name, you know, they come in and buy. But you would think that they would do some research on these companies that are trying to come in and buy. Well, I mean, I, I think the, the problem really is, is that we've convinced ourselves that there is no going back. Yes, it's bad, but if we went back, it would be even worse. And for the most part, people don't understand what the Chinese Communist Party ultimate objective is. And they don't understand how over time, you know, selling all your resources, selling your um, manufacturing capacity, basically selling everything that makes you independent and sovereign means that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, you know, here in the United States, we spent, you know, almost $900 billion on defense was the last um, uh, budget. Not going to make a hill of beans different because you don't own anything. Right. And, and so we went, when I said all those people that passed away or gone out of government that, that actually thought about the Cold War, we don't have any strategic thinkers anymore that understand kind of what we had in the beginning and, and as the country was founded through our formative years that, that stayed with us all the way through the Cold War it is just this cadre of people that understood uh, geopolitics, understood strategy, understood how important 
the economy was and our relationships, economic relationships and financial relationships around the world to protecting our independence and sovereignty. And, you know, when the Cold War ended, there was this kind of collective sigh in this realization that, hey, we don't have to do this anymore. All you guys, all you gals, all you cold warriors go away, not needed anymore. Everybody um, uh, basically uh, believes America is supreme, and that means everybody's going to play by the rules. And these two Chinese lieutenant colonels sat down and said, okay, well, they're just taking all their toys and going home. They're taking all their pieces off the risk board, and they're saying, eh, we don't care about it anymore. We care, meaning them. I care, meaning the guys that were writing that document, like this is how we take advantage of it, guys. They're just walking away from it. It's all open to us. And you know, when when you're a CEO of a corporation, when you're a um, congressman, uh, when you're a senator, you know, you're not thinking about geopolitics. You're not thinking about it in the terms that China does, in terms of long-term competition, long-term survival. How do we protect our uh, long-term political independence and sovereignty? They are, and they are not just in their corporations, but in their um, in their government, in their military, across their society, their educational institutions. Everything has been prepared for this war, war with the West, that they intend to win. And since we're not going to even play the game, we're not even going to uh, recognize what they're doing. You know, it's like, let's run up the score. Let's let's beat them 110 to nothing. So, and and not to kind of make a bad situation even worse, but the, uh, one side question here is, they do make all of our antibiotics plus process a lot of our, our food. But let's think about the drugs in particular. We're letting them make, you know, all our pharmaceuticals. How easy it would be for them to kind of change the formula a little bit and start to, you know, as we discussed last time, with with their their involvement in, in fentanyl in the U.S., how come they you know how easy it would it be for them to manipulate our pharmaceuticals in ways that would be almost undetected and kill us? Yeah, start damaging us that way. Well, I mean, they are in a sense doing that with fentanyl. Fentanyl precursors and fentanyl comes from China. That's where it's being manufactured. And uh, <laughs> you know, I, I I remember when I was in the White House and I I, I um, met with the assistant or the the acting director of the ONDCP. And I said, what are we doing about fentanyl? And he's like, the Chinese are cooperating with us. I said, no, they're not. I mean, fentanyl deaths are tens of thousands of Americans years. a year. What are we doing? And he says, it's not a problem. You know, there's nothing they can do. I'm like, what are you talking about? This totalitarian society that can control, uh, you know, everything that you do uh, using social credit. You don't think they can stop fentanyl? Oh, no, you know, we don't think of it like that. And so um, to answer your question, they're already doing it. They're doing it in, in a lot of these places that produce the fentanyl and the precursors are themselves, you know, manufacturing pharmaceuticals. So it's, you know, they, they do fentanyl at night and they do pharmaceuticals during the day. So I would venture to say to the extent they can get away with it, there are impurities that you find in Chinese um, uh, medicines. Now, could they deliberately add uh, stuff to? Of course they could. They do yeah. that in China. They do. I mean, they, yeah. they, they, infant formula. They they basically put uh, melamine in and it. Melamine in the milk. All kinds of babies. Yes. I mean, they do this to their own people. Right. So yes, they could do it to us. I lived there when they did that and I just couldn't believe it. So I, you know, if they can do that to their own people, right. What are they doing to our antibiotics? I mean, are we preparing for that? Are, do we have any facilities here? Are we changing this? I mean- I ask those questions, those very questions to people that are responsible. And the answer is, well, we're doing that for the military. We're um, stocking up on supplies for the military. Like, what about the rest of us? I'm like, that's not their job, right? The, 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 the free market takes care of everybody else. You know, this in my, my company, you know, we're, we're thinking about not just how do we protect military communications, but, you know, our neighborhood communications. The government doesn't think about that, though. That's, that's, that's the, the private sector, AT&T. You go out and think about protecting America, but AT&T is not incentivized to build infrastructure that will survive, say, an EMP attack or whatever. That is the way that our system is. There's this complete separation between the government and the people. And the people are kind of have to fend for themselves in this, uh, in this environment. So when, so I tell people, like, you better get some antibiotics and put them in your closet because if this happens, you're going to go down the shelves. Just like 
coronavirus, you, there's no toilet paper. Toilet paper is one thing. Antibiotics, that's a big problem. So you go to the doctor and you're like, sorry, there's no medicine for you. What would have been an easily cured infection, um, tough luck. I just hope that, you know, I feel like even if they are giving us the antibiotics, I mean, I feel like they would put things in there to slowly kill us. Or they would use that as leverage to just say, go sit in your corner. In, in fact, you know, they have told our leaders this. You don't get involved, everything will be fine. You get involved, you know, you're going to pay the price. And and this is the type of price that because we, we've never been in this situation before. So I don't think the American people understand how, like even Europe before, we could then, if something happened, we could give Europe stuff. We could give Canada stuff. We could give, we could give our friends stuff. We can't even give ourselves stuff. So now, now right. we're in a situation where, you know, it, it, it's really bad. And um, I think the reason that we have such a fear of China in Washington, D.C. is because we recognize that we've put in ourselves uh, and our families, our citizens in a completely vulnerable situation. And we have, what can we do? What can we do now? So it sounds like what we will do most likely, and on, this might be a best case scenario, is they're going one sooner or later, and we can discuss timing in a second, but sooner or later, they're going to invade Taiwan and just claim it as theirs. And we're going to talk big, but ultimately do nothing and eventually seek to repair relations just because we can't do without China for a lot of these reasons. You know, again, we'll probably for years attempt to move our supply chain and maybe be successful with part of it, maybe not. And our business as usual will become this sort of coldish kind of war that essentially is the new normal. It sounds like that's the best case scenario. Yeah, I, I think, but my, I guess my point is, whereas in the first Cold War, uh, when you looked at the shelves in, in American supermarkets, they were full. When you looked in Russia and the Soviet Union, they were empty. You're going to see full shelves in China and its satellites and empty shelves in America and its allies and partners. That's going to be the difference. How long do you think it would take to, to move our supply chain off of China, realistically? Realistically, I would say uh, in the realm of three to five years, it's is I hope it's already started to do that. I would assume. Well, you know, there there's things that happen, like the Chips Act, for example. We said we're going to build, um, you know, chip fabs in in the United States, but even that bill, as it was going through the process, you know, the chip companies told Congress, "Well, we want ability to in your so you're going to invest your money in in building in infrastructure here." We would like the ability to spend our money in China, hmm. right? So, I mean, this is the kind of half measures that we have going on in that, you know, we allow, so the, our corporations are incentivized by China to continue to flow capital and talent and in, um, in technology into China. And even when that CHIP Act was designed to say, hey, we need to have our own chip manufacturing capability here in the West, but the corporations are watering it down. So. Ultimately, more private capital drives innovation and productivity than government capital. Government capital is kind of primes the pump, but private capital is really needed. But in this case, and what used to be the case before, is the private capital followed the government capital into places like Silicon Valley. Today, there's no money being uh, raised, in, you know, in really in the venture sense in Silicon Valley. But Sequoia China just raised nine billion. You know, so everyone pencils down. And Sequoia China went and raised $9 billion. And so the, our capital is flowing in opposite direction for what it needs to do to actually support these initiatives that the government wants to do to basically get our industrial base back. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. 
As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a mizzen and main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James, that's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M I Z Z E N and Main.com. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I had come up with this idea. It's 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 a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, Download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. We need some optimism here. Like, can you weave your way through to any positive scenario for us? Like, or or maybe a negative outcome for, for China or maybe a change of regime or something that, that happens. Like, what's some other possibilities that, that are po more positive? Well, so the positive uh, is really this, and that is free societies are more productive, period. End of story. And so if we can get the China out of, the DNA of Western societies, democracies, and allow them to just work together. It's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. But ultimately, it's going to be better because that technology, talent, and capital will not be flying into China. It will be staying at home. And when it stays at home, free people tend to be more productive. And so this model that China has basically shown to the world is kind of like the building that cousin Vinny shows to the guys that are on trial in My Cousin Vinny. He's like, they're going to show you the bricks and they're really solid bricks and then you turn them on and it's just a card trick. Yeah, that's China. That's what they do. China, that's China. But right now, it looks like a big solid building. Once you start to pull the democracies out and decouple and you have the technology talent capital from free societies being reinvested, it's going to be difficult 
But over time, we'll start to grow and they'll start to decline because they will not no longer have that. This is going to be a long-term competition. So when I say, what is the best case scenario for me? Let's just get the Taiwan thing over. Let's have it happen because that's the only thing that's going to wake us up and actually have us economically, financially, politically, academically decouple from China and begin to, as democracies, work together. And I think in the end, you know, we can be victorious. The worst scenario is if we never wake up, if we never realize what China is, slowly we will become China because that's what we're doing today. Well, and maybe even a, a, a more worst case scenario is if we have very short term thinking or, or pressure from media or whatever it is, whereas when they invade Taiwan, we feel like we need to respond militarily. That seems like a worst case scenario. But I just, even, despite all our posturing, I just don't see it happening. But how do we back off from that when, when the event happens? How do we save face? Yeah, I mean, you make a good point. Um, my uh, concern is it's the lack of strategic thinking in Washington, D.C. And I think, you know, um, my hope, my hope, my fervent hope is that cooler heads prevail. Um, nuclear weapons change the game. And, and we have to basically begin to respect those, think about them and understand that, you know, we can't just willy-nilly go off to war with a nuclear power, we have to think very carefully about that. Um, you know, we have a deliberative process in Washington, D.C., and we have a democracy. So hopefully, you know, cooler heads will prevail, that we won't slide into war. That being said, we found ourselves in wars that we didn't want to be in. So I don't know. I mean, that's, if you want to talk about the worst case scenario, not just for America, but for the world, it's that we just let a war happen um, that we probably shouldn't have gotten into. I mean, why did Nancy Pelosi, the, correctly or incorrectly, why did she visit and why is President Biden denying he had any involvement in that decision? Well, I think people believe that um, they can deter China by reinforcing American support for Taiwan. And I don't think that's possible. And so, you know, Pelosi's visit was to, you know, essentially send a message to both China and Taiwan that we're supporting them. Um, unfortunately, um, in, the way that we did it in Europe is we actually put nu nuclear weapons in Europe. And so, um, and so that was one of the ways that we reinforced this message that if you attack, you know, uh, there not only will Mar Americans be killed, but there will be nuclear weapons there that, you know, our allies can respond with. Um, there's not enough recognition that, you know, just because Pelosi goes to Taiwan doesn't mean the Chinese are going to be deterred from attack. They actually have to feel some kind of threat. And uh, they don't feel a threat. Uh, they don't feel afraid. You have to feel afraid for you to think twice about doing something. If you're, if there's nothing, you know, when you think about it, just at a very basic level, how does Pelosi going to Taiwan actually make China feel afraid? It doesn't. But we have convinced ourselves in Washington, D.C. that we can create the, um, I don't know, perception of deterrence by uh, demonstrating our resolve to protect Taiwan. I think, you know, the Chinese Communist Party sees right through that. And because we haven't, because exactly what you're saying, I think what's going to happen is we're going to recognize that oh my gosh, we're talking about trading uh, Taiwan for LA and Washington, D.C. and New York, and that's not, that's not okay. We're going to back off. And, and, and I think the Chinese Communist Party knows it. Uh, I think deep down inside, we know it. But that's why she went. Was, you know, it's, it was a deterrence measure. And um, you know, in many ways, the, um, the, the administration itself was deterred because, you know, of course, you know, it doesn't have any control over the legislative branch. But it doesn't want, and it thinks that somehow if it manages the relationship with China, they can prevent, you know, a war from happening. They can't. They have no control over it. It's entirely in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. And so we, you know, unfortunately, because we don't recognize that, number one, even if the Chinese say they're getting mad, it doesn't matter. They're either going to invade or they're not. Either way, you, there's nothing you can do about it. And so we just need to do what we think is right. And I think, so in that respect, I do think that, um, you know, 
possibly you could say that you know, by going to Taiwan, you are emboldening the Taiwanese people um, that we will we will come to their aid. Uh, I think you know if I was don't, just thinking about the problem, you know, in terms of you know what would be the right uh, approach. I think the right approach is to prepare Taiwan uh, and the Taiwanese people for the eventual reunification using force. How many of you want to stay? Um, how many of you want to leave? What can we do? What can America do to um, ease this transition to prevent loss of life? You know, what can we negotiate with the Chinese? In that case, we could say, hey, we are willing to fight you if you don't allow us to um, evacuate those that want to leave. We could say that and back it up. And I think the Chinese would basically say, okay, you want to evacuate those people and you're serious and uh, willing to lay down your lives for that, then I think, you know, for them, they're going to get to Taiwan, then they would probably, you know, negotiate. So you have to think through the problem, recognize they're going to do it either way. You can't stop it uh, short of giving Taiwan nuclear weapons. Okay, what's our role? Our role is to prevent human suffering. How do we do that in the most efficient and effective way possible? And, and do you think that's enough for us to save face worldwide after all the posturing we've done? Oh, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, if the alternative is, right. is a nuclear war, I think it doesn't really saving face. I mean, that's that's um, we're we're past the point now where American credibility is on the line. I mean, you're talking about human lives, right? What how, what do we have to do to protect human lives? It's not about American credibility anymore. It's about uh, the safety and welfare of people. And and, and there's 23 million people on Taiwan. Yeah. That should mean something more so than American. Uh, you know, credibility in terms of uh, losing face. Now, Chinese leadership, they don't care about human lives. They're willing to take those at the drop of a hat. But for us, um, where, you know, um, uh, human life is very important, you know, that has to be the overwhelming um, imperative for, for America. And what do you think is the timing on, if you were to guess, you know, tensions are rising nonstop. Like they never go down, they just go up. I, I would be surprised if they don't invade before um, Biden's um, 10 years out. I would be very surprised. Hmm. And what makes us think that they'll stop there? I mean, well, if they go to Sri Lanka or they go to these places that they want, I mean, Japan, Korea, you know. Yeah, well, I think I think they already are, but I think they're going in a way that's not kind of recognized as what they're doing. I mean, you look along the Belt and Road Initiative countries, tens of thousands of Chinese have emigrated to those areas and created yeah. their own kind of city states. Um, so I think you, you are seeing a kind of a, a migration of people. Um, one of the things that happened with regard to China is this um, a one child policy uh, created this overwhelming uh, imbalance in males, uh, young males versus females. What, what do they do with those millions of um, males that don't have uh, women to, um, to marry? Um, they're, they're, they're sending them off to the Belt and Road Initiative countries to intermarry with the um, populations there. So I, I think, you know, when, and if you study Chinese history, the, you know, China has, um, has been invaded m many times over the last 5,000 years, and each time has succeeded in basically um, subsuming the invaders, creating, you know, making them into Chinese. Um, this happened, you know, over and over again. So I think they're very good at, at basically, um, you know, using just the, the might of the people itself to, uh, to be able to spread uh, in a missionary way um, their model. And, you know, these people that, that migrate to these countries are very loyal to, mm -hmm. to China, to, to, to mother China. And so I think they're doing it in a way that's not as, um, it's, they're using money. They're using money and the promise of um, productivity and, and economic growth to soothe the transition. So it's very much a um, neo-colonial way of doing things without, without you know, the, the gunboats of the, of the British Empire. And, and another thing that I'm, I'm wondering, you know, they're, they're meeting with the Saudis and, and working out deals with that, but why aren't they doing it with Iran? It's interesting that they're, that they're you know, talking with, with, with the Saudis. And I know the difference with the Saudis and Iran. And they're buying oil from Iran. They've been buying oil from Iran. They've been sending products to Iran. I mean, 
that's how Iran and North Korea and, you know, Russia have prospered, even when they're cut off, like, you know, Russia's day after invading Ukraine. It's because of their relationship to China. So I just don't see how the Saudis are, you know, are happy with that, because I know that that's a big problem with them, you know, with the Saudis and the Iranians. They're wanting them to, you know, stay. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's a whole nother story. You, you notice that she goes to Iran. When he goes to Iran, he goes to Saudi. So right. um, they're 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 trying to, um, you know, I think they're trying to play both sides of yeah. it. And uh, you're right. Unfortunately, though, you know, what's Saudi going to do? I mean, right. you know, America is kind of, you know, now, uh, you know, was had was trying to create a stronger relationship with the Gulf countries. Now mm-hmm. it's kind of letting Iran off the hook. So what's Saudi going to do? I mean, it's kind of stuck stuck between you know the fact that the United States no longer supports it, China supporting Iran. It's a big so they've mess. got to go and kind of make friends with China, and uh, and hope that they will um, you know rein Iran in. Um, uh, I think the other thing is they're going to try to figure out a way to get nuclear weapons. And then none of the families, all the families, you know, the royal families in the Gulf, you know, they're all the Sunni families. So I mean, they'll be completely destroyed if Iran comes out and it's just going to be a big mess. I don't know. And China is going to be the one maybe managing or they think they're going to manage it all, but it's like, it's really sticky, a very sticky situation. Yeah. I mean, the, the um, geopolitics and strategy when it comes to the political independence and sovereignty of the nation cannot always be run by the U.S. media, which is what we tend to want to do. We want to say, okay, we want to vilify um, the leaders of Saudi Arabia. We want to vilify the leaders of Russia. We want to make it difficult for us to, you know, create wedges between, you know, say Russia and China or China and Saudi Arabia. You know, that's why um, Nixon, for example, went to China. Mm -hmm. He, He was trying to create a wedge between um, China and and the Soviet Union for the purposes of basically, you know, winning the Cold War. Unfortunately, we took it too far. But, you know, when we when you look at the media and you kind of look at how people react and you look at how people act, there's much less recognition that people like Nixon are needed to, you know, essentially recognize that the world is an ugly place. It is mm-hmm. an ugly place. We have to accept it for what it is. It's a little bit brighter because countries like America exist. Uh, but in order for us to ensure that countries like America ex- exist, we're going to have to sometimes have relations with countries that aren't necessarily, you know, our favorite. But the alternative is, you know, allowing a power like the Soviet Union or in this case, China to arise and dominate the international space because uh, we can't be seen as intermingling or having a relationship with a nation that does something that we find untoward. And so in all cases, when it comes to the survival of our republic, we have to basically make decisions that um, that are rational, that support our political independence and sovereignty. And sometimes we have to do what we need to do in order to preserve the Republic, Mm -hmm. even if that's not what we really want to do. You know, it is like you do something where, you know, the alternative is you save one person, uh, but you lose 40 people or you lose that one person you save for, do do you want to lose anybody? No, you don't want to lose anybody. But sometimes you got in, in, in the world, and in life, you have to make very hard decisions. That's why um, leaders of countries, they have to be steadfast and they have to actually be very um, solemn in their duty to protect the country. I mean, the reason we have uh, the government that we, that we have is primarily because of national security reasons. If you read the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton and others really talked about the need to protect the political independence and sovereignty of the nation. and um, when you're considering things like this, there's a lot of stuff that you make decisions on as a national leader. Um, probably one of the most important is, you know, the the geopolitical and strategic and national security decisions that you make that ensure the survival of your people and your nation. And um, and that's one where I think that we are um, since the end of the Cold War, we haven't perceived a threat to that, and that's the problem. We we are really threatened. We're more threatened than we've ever been. 
And yet we, um, we're not making the hard decisions that we need to make to protect ourselves. We don't have Nixon's anymore. We don't have Winston right. Churchill's. We don't have Ronald Reagan's. Um, we don't have, um, you know, John F. Kennedy's. They're gone. Yeah. And we've had 30 years of peace and it's really, really hurt our strategic leadership. I mean, hopefully when the reality of this situation sets in, whether it's Taiwan or the threat to our supply chain or, you know, the threat to our allegiances with other countries, the, the U.S. is forced to take a course like you suggest and think long term and strategically. And, and it becomes more like a chess game than a fist fight. We can only hope, and my guess is that's what will happen, but with great pain to us, as you've been describing. And that really does seem like our best case scenario. And hopefully that happens rather than, a, a, you know, war. I also heard that the Chinese government, they're, they're trying to poach scientists and other countries to come aboard, such as Israel and some other countries. And of course, I think they've been turned down, but that's very scary as well. I mean, they're, they're out looking for talent, you know. Well, and, and because they're coupled to us academically, they can pay a Harvard professor, you know, that's an expert in, uh, right. in, uh, in nano to come over and work with their technology. And, you know, that person can be working on government, you know, DOD contracts and working for the Chinese People's Liberation Army. I mean, we've seen that already. Right. So um, decoupling academically and saying, no, absolutely, you cannot have any contact whatsoever uh, right. with China, I think is very, very important because, of course, they're going to continue to do that as long as they can. Right. Well, General Spalding, it hasn't always been positive in this conversation, but it's reality and it's what's happening. And and I'm so thankful that you came on our podcast to talk about this. This is very much on our minds and in, in the news, of course, and a lot of tensions are happening. And, you know, once again, you're the author of War Without Rules, China's Playbook for Global Domination. You've worked in the White House advising about China. You've been all, all over this topic from the beginning. And I really appreciate you giving us your insights into this. Thank you so much yes. for coming on the podcast Thank once again. Thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed the conversation. Same, yeah, appreciate same it. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. If you like this episode, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. It makes my life so much better when the listeners and when you subscribe. GNC has the weight loss solutions you've been looking for with no prescriptions, no sky high costs, and no hassle. Hunger satisfying high protein total lean lean shake 25 can help you feel fuller longer. And Slim Vance XP is clinically shown to help you shed pounds fast. See results in just two weeks. Try one or try them together. Start your weight loss journey today by visiting your local GNC or just pick up your phone and go to GNC.com. We're here to help you lose weight. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Look around. You can find cars like these on AutoTrader. New cars, used cars, electric cars, maybe even flying cars. Okay, no flying cars, but as soon as they get invented, they'll be on AutoTrader. Just you wait. AutoTrader.